Good afternoon and welcome, everybody. I'm Eric Schickler, chair of the Charles and Louise Travers Department of Political Science. And on behalf of the entire department, I wanted to thank you all for coming. And uh, I want, in addition to the political science department being one of the top departments in the country, we aspire to foster discussion, dialogue, debate, and fresh exchange of ideas. And that really brings me to the event of today, where it's my privilege to welcome you to the Baxter Liberty Initiative, a program created thanks to the generous support of Ambassador Frank Baxter, who is here with us today. This is a very important program, not only for the department, but for the entire campus community, because it offers a, a platform for preeminent scholars to talk with us about important issues that spark a debate, and then to have a, a distinguished respondent follow up with questions and further discussion. So without further de delay, let the, let's get the program started. And it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jack Citrin, my colleague, the Heller Professor of P Political Science and Director of the Institute of Governmental Studies. Jack has really been the kind of s uh, leader of the creative team shaping this initiative at Berkeley. And this is the fourth such event. And I wanted to thank Jack and the staff at IGS for all their hard work in putting the, the event together. So Jack. Thank you very much, Eric. I would have, I'd like to add this is a collaborative event with the College of Letters of Science and the, there's a faculty committee that has been managing this program. David Hollinger, professor of history, is here. Kinch Hawkstra, I can't see Kinch, but he, I saw him walk in. Uh, a colleague of mine and uh, the political science department have been instrumental in helping shape this. So, uh, I guess my role is the MC, and as the MC is like when you go to the movies, you ask people to turn off their pagers and cell phones. So I'm going to say that before I get to the serious part of the business. And the serious part of the business begins with I want to recognize Dean of College of Letters and Science, Carla Hesse, who really conceived of this idea together with Frank and who has been an inspiration for it throughout the three years. And also Dean Anthony Cascardi of Humanities is here, so another administration official who is important in guiding the academic programs on this campus. Uh, before I introduce John Searle, uh, Professor Searle, my friend and colleague and neighbor down the hall, I'd like to first introduce Frank Baxter, whose generosity has made this entire program possible. There's a little blurb about Frank here on the back of the program. I'll repeat part of it and then add something that is not listed there. Frank is a native of Northern California. I think Auburn, is that correct, Frank? Near Auburn. He graduated from Cal with a BA degrees in economics with honors in 1961. Before that, he had enlisted and served in the Air Force. From 1974 until 2002, he was employed by Jeffries and Company, a global investment company and he became CEO of the firm, and after his retirement, he still serves as chairman emeritus of the firm. Uh, before, from 2006 to 2009, he was the ambassador to the Oriental Republic of Uruguay, known to most people as Uruguay, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he is, remains closely connected to that country, which I think he and Kathy Baxter, his wife, enjoyed immensely, they've said that, and Frank is now the honorable Honorary Consul for Uruguay in the state of California in Sacramento. Uh, as a trustee of the Berkeley Foundation, Frank has demonstrated his deep commitment and philanthropy to the university. Uh, he served in a multiple capacity there and continues to do so today as I think the chair of the executive committee. Um, uh, I want to say one more thing about Frank, because I know this, and it's not in the Vita. He has a deep commitment to education and to the access for people, disadvantaged students, to higher education. He is the co-chair of a group which manages 22 middle and high school charter schools in, inner, in Los Angeles County in the inner city. Uh, they have a record of 94% graduation of kids in their high school, 
and 94% of them go on to college, including some who come here to Berkeley. And I think, Frank, this is a reflection of your own sense of your own experience of being able to come here as a child of a not wealthy family. So thank you very much for all you've done, and I welcome you to say a few words if you'd like. Thank you so much, Jack. You read what I wrote very, very well. Appreciate it. <laughs> and there's something that uh, Jack and I have uh, something in common. Actually, he met my wife before I met her. They were both students at the American School in Japan a couple of decades ago. And, uh, just last year. Huh? <laughs> and it was just by coincidence that uh, Carla and I spoke, and it turned out that uh, she asked Jack to do it. He said, oh, oh I, know that, I know that guy. He's, he's one of these right-wing people, not many of these around Cal. Um, you know, I, um, when, when I was, I graduated in 1961, uh, I think there were an awful lot of freedom-loving, liberty-loving uh, people there, people that hated coercion. I know in my case, I was, I was uh, chairman of the Young Republicans at another college, and I uh, uh, did an open letter uh, Compl uh, complaining against the loyalty oath that at that time professors were required to sign that they were going to be loyal to our uh, country and, and I, I felt that as I have served in government positions I'm very happy to give my give my loyalty in that position but as a private citizen I thought that was terribly wrong and some of my right wing buddies didn't think that was that I was too right right on that but I I, I still do and and uh, I had classmates, actually just a little bit after I got out of school, that went to prison for political action by burning their draft cards, and one of my really good friends did that. Had other uh, uh, classmates who went to prison or went into exile because they objected to uh, the war in, uh, in Vietnam. And I've, I've got a really good uh, grounding in the meaning of liberty and the value of liberty, and I, I, I left here um, with a, a, a deep sense of that, a deep distrust of coercion. And I know that there were a lot of people on campus in addition, sort of, I guess it, it goes with every academy, there were the, the uh, uh, philo uh, philosopher kings uh, that uh, felt that they might have a better idea, particularly if, if they were kings. They're not so many at Berkeley, they're more to the west and to the east of us in the academies, but... Um, uh, fortunately, I, I uh, listened to mostly the people that really advocated freedom, free enterprise, uh, personal, personal uh, liberty, and um, I really uh, f uh, followed that that uh, limited government, uh, believing, uh, as Arthur Brooks, who spoke here last year, in um, that that earned success is a great path to uh, happiness, and and I found that for me and people around me, but over the last several years, I've noticed some things. I think Thomas Jefferson, I didn't quote him, I don't quote him exactly, but he said something like, the natural uh, course is for liberty to retreat to tyranny or some, something to that extent. And there's just so much evidence, evidence of that. I think Freedom House recently uh, reported that, uh, that liberty has gone down for people around the world for eight years in a row. Uh, we have great large parts of our globe that feel that democracy, which is the best environment for liberty, is may not, maybe not the best way to govern. And we have some pretty successful countries that are at least successful materially that are trying to demonstrate that, and a lot of people are following. We have a lot of nominal democracies uh, that are, are really tyrannical. I, in Uruguay, I was next to a, uh, at one time, one of the most richest countries in the world that has been corporatist for the last 60 years at a great, uh, at great peril to, uh, to uh, many, many uh, people. And so it, it occurred to me that going back to the university that I, that I love that has freedom, that it would be very worthwhile to have people who have thought about freedom and thought about liberty for a long time to share their thoughts and so just kind of refresh us. Uh, so uh, I think uh, democracy is not a spectator sport 
And I think we just have to be reminded that uh, as, we're, as, as we are uh, concerned or the, about the trade-off between security and freedom, it seems like it, the, the, that's a very big issue for us at the moment. So I think it's, it's really a good time to be thinking about it and have such a distinguished uh, speaker to, to do that for us. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well, I think that today's speaker is someone who has been committed to academic freedom and uh, open-mindedness and challenging uh, conventional wisdom for many, many years. So let me introduce John Searle. I don't know how much introduction he really needs to a campus audience, but I will tell you that John was born in Denver, Colorado. He received his university education at the University of Wisconsin and at Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He received his degrees, BA, MA, and DPhil from Oxford. His first academic position was as a lecturer at Oxford at Christ Church College, but since 1959, he's been a professor here at Berkeley, where he's now the William S. and Marion Slusser Professor of the Philosophy of Mind and Language. He has been a visiting professor at a large number of universities throughout the world. His work is so broad it ranges over philosophical problems of mind, language, society. Uh, I'm not going to read all his 20 books, but among them are The Mystery of Consciousness, Mind, Language, and Society, Philosophy in the Real World, Rationality in Action, Mind. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce the French book there, John, but... Uh, and lately making the social world the structure of human civilization, and I know there are more to come. He's also the author of about 200 articles. His works are translated into over 20 languages. He has so many prizes, among them are the Jean Nico Prize, the National Humanities Medal, the Mind and Brain Prize, among many other awards and honorary degrees. When I first saw his CV, my first thought was, let me plagiarize about 10% and submit it as mine, and I'll get promoted somehow. <laughs> but honesty prevailed, you know. Okay. Um, I want to say just one last thing about John, and that is his ongoing and continuing and long-standing commitment to teaching. He has taught all these years, this semester, he's teaching two large upper division undergraduate courses, as well as conducting a very large and lively colloquium in social ontology for graduate students, postdocs, visiting scholars, many of whom are from Europe. And along with writing all these books simultaneously, to be able to do that and to prepare this lecture is quite amazing. So please welcome John Searle. Uh, well, I want to uh, thank you for inviting me, and a uh, special thanks to be invited to give a lecture in Berkeley. <laughs> now, I lecture all over the damn world. I lecture in uh, uh, Barcelona and uh, Brazil and Beijing. Nobody ever invites me to give a public lecture in Berkeley. But anyway, <laughs> it's a great pleasure, a great honor to be here, and I only hope I was worthy of the invitation. So anyway, here goes. Uh, we're going to talk about human freedoms. I like the plural uh, because essentially if you stay with the abstract, there's a, a strong tendency to hot air. Uh, we're all for human freedom, but I want to know which ones exactly, and I'm going to talk about which ones exactly uh, I'm going to be concerned with. However, uh, I'm a philosopher, so I want to put a theoretical uh, foundation under all of this, and that is I think I have to talk about the nature of human civilization. How about that? Um, so I'm going to explain, and here comes another polysyllabic word, I'm going to explain the ontology of human civilization. Ontology just means the mode of existence, how it really is. Uh, the ontology of human civilization, and so we can understand human rights and human freedoms as an aspect of that mode of existence, an aspect of how human beings are. And it ought to strike us that though we are continuous, 
uh, with the animal kingdom. They tell us we have 92% of the same uh, DNA as chimpanzees. I'm not sure I believe it, but anyway, let's go along with it because they say that kind of stuff. Um, they get paid to say that. Uh, so we're 92%. All the same, we are in interesting respects different. I've, I have a very intelligent dog. I've had brilliant dogs. Their names are Frega, uh, Russell, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Gilbert, and now Tarski. Uh, and, uh, well, he's Tarski because I had to have him flown in from Warsaw and have him use a Polish philosopher's name. And the other Polish philosopher's names I know are Adzukiewicz, Kotarbinski, and, 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 and uh, Lukashevitz. And you can't go around the neighborhood shouting Lukashevitz, you know. But <laughs> Tarski, I could at least shout around the neighborhood. Anyway, a very intelligent dog. But Tarski is not there thinking about how the hell is he going to do the income tax on time this year, as I am. Uh, and he's not busy thinking about what's he going to do about tomorrow's lecture. And he's not busy thinking about all of those distinctive things about human civilization. Unlike the other animals, we have money, property, government, marriage, cocktail parties, university lectures, summer vacations, I, and I, I, even sabbaticals, and no animal that I know has that. Now, uh, philosophers love paradox, so I want to start with a paradox. The paradox is this. We live in a sea of human institutions, and within those institutions, we live in a sea of institutional facts. I am a professor, I'm a citizen, I'm the owner of a car, uh, I'm a guy who's behind on his income tax. I mean, there are all these wonderful institutional facts that I partake of, and they are all objective facts. Now, here's the interesting thing. Though they're objective facts, <clears throat> they're all created by subjective human attitudes. Uh, I'm only a professor because, roughly speaking, we all think I am. And if we all stop thinking that, uh, it wouldn't work so well. And I carry around these sorted bits of paper, and though they're sorted, it's uh, just a, a piece of cellulose fibers with ink stains, it's kind of interesting because it's money. Now, what fact makes it money? Uh, the fact that makes it money, uh, to put it very crudely, is we think it's money. <laughs> of course, we get help from the Department of the Treasury, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and so on. If I print out something that looks exactly like this, it's not money, okay? Uh, in fact, I'm in deep trouble if I print out something that looks exactly like this. All right, so how can that be? That's our first question. How can it be the case that there is a class of objective facts that are only facts uh, because we have subjective attitudes toward them? And I'm going to offer you a, a swift solution to that paradox because it's going to be important for what I'm going to say later on. The famous distinction uh, between, uh, the epis between uh, the objective and subjective is systematically ambiguous in ways that have been pretty much disastrous in the history of the philosophy. The history of philosophy, there's a systematic ambiguity between the epistemic sense of these terms, where epistemology means having to do with knowledge, and the ontological sense, which means having to do with existence. Epistemically, the distinction is between different kinds of claims. Uh, so if I say uh, Van Gogh died in France, uh, that is uh, an epistemically objective claim. You can settle that as a matter of fact. If I say Van Gogh was a better painter than Gauguin, well, I think that's right, and I'd argue for it, but as they say, it's a matter of subjective opinion. That's epistemically subjective. Now, I want you to get that, that there can be epistemically objective facts and epistemically subjective claims. Epistemology here is a feature of claims. Underlying that distinction is a distinction in modes of existence, and that's the ontological sense of this distinction. And that is the distinction between things that only exist because they're experienced by a human or animal subject. I think of pains and tickles and itches uh, and uh, irritations and so on. All of those are ontologically subjective. They exist as part of your experience. But there's an ontologically objective set of, of uh, features which exist regardless of what anybody experiences, and that includes mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates. They exist as they are, and they don't give a damn about any of us. Okay, now here's the point of the distinction. 
You can have a domain that is, epistem that is ontologically subjective, and yet you can make, make epistemically objective claims about that domain. And this is a very important point, because when I first got interested in consciousness, I used to go over to UCSF and tell those guys, I want you to solve the problem of consciousness. What the hell am I paying you to do? Get busy and figure out how the brain does it. And a standard answer to me was, no, consciousness is subjective, science is objective, therefore there cannot be a science of consciousness. Now by now you all recognize that as a fallacy of ambiguity. Science is indeed epistemically objective, uh, but it doesn't follow from the epistemic objectivity of science that you can't have an objective science of a subjective domain. The domain of consciousness is ontologically subjective, but you can have an epistemically objective science of that domain. And we're going to talk about class of entities that are, have an element of ontological subjectivity, but I'm going to try to make epistemically objective claims about that domain, and that's the domain of human rights and other institutional facts. Okay, now in addition to that, I, philosophers love distinction, so I got another one coming here. Uh, you have to distinguish between those features of the world that exist regardless of what anybody thinks. Uh, and they are, we might say, observer independent. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about hydrogen atoms. They all have one electron. They always did, they always will, and nobody cares. Uh, uh, and they don't care about uh, what we think about them. But there's also a class of entities that only exist because we think they exist. They are observer relative in their existence. And that's the domain that interests us now. That's the domain that includes money, property, government, and marriage. Uh, all of those have our observer relative. They only exist because of people's attitudes. So remember, though, you can have a domain that is observer relative and thus contains an element of ontological subjectivity, but you can still have an objective science, an objective account of that domain. Okay, now with all that by way of uh, getting going, I want to talk about these facts. I want to talk about money and property and government and marriage and universities and governments and, and, um, uh, and national elections and uh, uh, PhD degrees uh, and all of the other stuff that figure so importantly in our life. And those, uh, you will recognize by now, have an element of ontological subjectivity because they're all observer relative in their mode of existence, but we can have, make objective claims about them. Now here is the first stunning fact about human beings. How do we do it? How do we create this sea of institutional reality? Look around you, think about your daily life, and you will see a very large percentage of it is occupied with institutional facts. You are a citizen, you own a car, you're a taxpayer in the state of California, you have an employer, you have a summer vacation to look forward to. All of these are institutional facts, and the question is, how do we do that? How do we create them? And my instinct is it must be a fairly simple mechanism because we're not all that smart. We can't do some uh, work of genius over and over every time uh, we, uh, uh, we create a new club. And I came to the conclusion there's a simple principle that we apply over and over to create institutional reality out of brute reality. We take something and we count it as something that it isn't intrinsically, but we give it an observer relative status. We take some piece of paper or uh, some other physical object and we count it as having a certain status and we say X counts as Y in context C. So this piece of paper counts as a $20 bill in the United States of America. These noises come out, coming out of my mouth count as utterance of English sentences. I count as a professor in this university. Very simple apparatus. Now, why do we do that? What's going on? Well, humans have a unique capacity, I, it, it, partly shared with the animals, and that is we can impose functions on objects where the function is not intrinsic to the object. So all of these, uh, fun all, I, my uh, pockets are full of objects that have functions imposed on them. I won't bore you with all the sorted uh, 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 objects that I have in my pocket, but they all have functions. 
and functions are observer relative. It's, this is only a, 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 a telephone and not a paperweight because that's what we've designed it and used it for. But here's what's remarkable about humans. They can create functions where the function is not performed solely in virtue of the physics of the object. The function is created and it works as a function because we assign a status to a person or an object. We say, this guy's a professor. This is a $20 bill. This is my property. We assign a status to a person or an object and then we count the object as having that status and in virtue of the status, it has a function that is only performed in virtue of the collective acceptance or recognition of that status. And I call those, just to have an unoriginal expression, I call those status functions. Now, the claim I'm going to make is that's essentially uh, the essence of human civilization. That's how we differ from other animals, is that we can assign these statuses to people and objects this guy's a professor. He's the president of the United States. This is my property. That's my car. This is a $20 bill. We assign these statuses, and with the status, we assign a function which can only be performed is if there is a collective acceptance of that status. Now, the question we're now addressing is, how does it work? And the, and the proposal that I'm making is the most general form of the creation of status functions is you count somebody as having a status which is not intrinsic to the, to the guy. It's not intrinsic to my biology uh, that I am a professor. I, in, a, in the case of uh, uh, Barack Obama, you can't find out that he's president by looking at his DNA or checking his blood pressure. It's, he's president because a certain status has been assigned to him, and with that status goes a whole lot of powers which can only function in virtue of the collective acceptance of that status. Now, the first claim I'm making is that the general form in which we do that is we count something as having a status where the status is not intrinsic to the physics of the object. You see, it's intrinsic to the physics of this object that I can write with it, but it's not intrinsic to the physics of this object the $20 bill that I can buy things with it. That is observer relative. That's a status function. That comes from the fact that we have created a class of objects that have the status of money, the status of currency. And the initial claim I'm making is we do that with this simple operation and we apply it over and over. Now you might think, well, that's too dumb. That's too pathetic an apparatus. You can't make human civilization out of that. It's all going to blow away uh, the moment there's a heavy rainstorm. Um, but in fact, it has remarkable uh, formal properties. One is it iterates upward indefinitely. So watch. Uh, there's a hole that opens in the bottom half of my face, and this noise comes out, right? But those noises count as the utterance of English sentences. But now, uttering English, cer certain English sentences counts as, for example, making a promise. And making certain kinds of promise counts as undertaking a contract. So you have x1 counts as y1, but y1 equals x2, and that counts as y2. And you can keep going upward as much as you want. So making a certain kind of promise counts as undertaking a contract, undertaking certain contracts, uh, count as getting married in the state of California. And of course, once you get married, all hell breaks loose from, a, from an institutional point of view. You have spousal benefits. Uh, you got income tax deductions. Uh, a male friend of mine uh, discovered that he had pregnancy rights. He had a difficult pregnancy and had to take time off from his job. Um, so uh, the, the human serpent is wonderfully ingenious uh, in its uh, 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 willingness to create these elaborate structures. So you keep going upwards, but furthermore, you get interlocking structures. I don't just have money, but I have money in my bank account at the Bank of America on Telegraph Avenue, and I use it to pay uh, my income tax and my credit card bills uh, and my uh, PG&E bills. Now, every noun phrase I uttered names a status function, except maybe Telegraph Avenue, though God knows maybe that's got a status I don't know about. Um, okay, so it, 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 you find your, as I said, we're in a sea of institutional reality, 
and this institutional reality contains all of these status functions. Now, why do we do it? What's the point? And the answer is, it creates power. We create power relations by creating all of these uh, status functions. But the power relations are peculiar because they're power relations that have to do with rights, duties, obligations, requirements, authorizations, permissions, etc. And just to have a, a pretentious word, I call those deontic powers, these rights, duties, and obligations. Now, why is that such a big deal? Well, to the extent that you accept uh, the rights, duties, and obligations, and other deontic powers, you have a set of reasons for action that are independent of your inclinations. Uh, you see, for example, uh, a guy invited me uh, on Wednesday afternoon uh, to show up here and give a talk, and I accepted. Uh, now, when Wednesday afternoon comes around, I don't say, well, let's go get a beer, you know, or something else like that, because why? I have undertaken an obligation. I made a promise. I created a desire-independent reason for action. And that, I think, is the key to understanding the difference between human civilization and other sorts of animal societies. We are enmeshed in an elaborate system of institutional facts. Each of those is a status function, and each status function carries deontic powers, and deontic powers give us desire-independent reasons for action. Okay, all of that is just preparatory. Now I'm going to talk about human freedoms. How much time did I leave myself? I mean, I hope I left enough time to keep going. Okay, let's keep going. Now there's an interesting point about this, and that is, I said X counts as Y and C, but you know, sometimes you can just create the status function without an X. Uh, the, my favorite example, and this really is an ingenious example of the human serpent in operation, the limited liability corporation is created out of thin air. See, it isn't that we took some piece of land or some building or some group of people and said, you are the IBM corporation. We took nothing and created the IBM uh, corporation. It's created out of nothing. We just create the status function. Uh, and in fact, my favorite example is money, but most money has no physical realization at all. Most of your money exists in the form of uh, computer traces on disks in banks. But those computer traces aren't money. They represent the amount of money you have. The representation is all that is necessary. There needn't be actual currency. I I'm very naive, and I think, look, at the Bank of America on Telegraph Avenue, I have an account. There has to be a drawer that's got my money in it, and I ought to be able to go and look at my money. Well, that's not how it works. Uh, well, the way that it works is the actual currency is more or less irrelevant. And you could imagine a system where there was no um, uh, a currency in use, and maybe we're moving toward that with the institution, the debit card. We may be moving toward a situation where you don't need actual currency, where it's all done by making entries in your account and in other people's account. What's going on here? Well, we have to ask ourselves, what is the logical form of this X counts as Y in C? What kind of a speech act is that? Okay, now I have to tell you a little bit about language. Not a lot, but a little bit. Language has at least two ways of relating to reality. Sometimes the words are supposed to represent how the world is independent of the words. And I think in simple metaphors, I say that has the downhill or word to world direction of fit. Statements and assertions are the favorite examples of that. And the mark of these guys is that they can be literally true or false. But there are a lot of utterances that are not designed to describe the world. They're designed to change it. I think of orders, commands, and promises. The order doesn't describe how the world is independently. It tries to change the world by getting you to change your behavior to match the content of the order. And the same with promises. If I promise to do something, then the aim is not to describe what's happening, but to make a commitment as to what I'm to do. 
and those have the world to word direction of fit. The world is supposed to change to match the words. That's, that's the world to word direction of fit in the case of orders and promises. Now, there's a whole lot of other things to be said. If I was going to lecture about language, I'd say a lot more, but let me just say this much. There is a remarkable thing that human beings have invented, and that is a device that has both directions of fit at once. Uh, the most famous examples of this are the so-called performatives. You can adjourn the meeting by saying the meeting is adjourned. Uh, you can pronounce somebody husband and wife if you are duly uh, authorized by saying I pronounce you husband and wife. Uh, in all of these cases, you change reality. You make it the case that the meeting is adjourned and thus you achieve the world to word direction of fit but you do it by representing reality as having been so changed. You make something the case by representing it as being the case, and thus you have both directions of fit at once, and I call those declarations. You declare something to be the case and thus make it the case. And the most famous examples are these with the performative verbs, like I pronounce you husband and wife, I adjourn the meeting, uh, war is hereby declared, but there are lots of declarations where there is no such verb. Again, my favorite example, I'm busy showing off my $20 bill here. Um, it says here, there's a stunning philosophical remark here. <laughs> this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Now, every one of us is an epistemologist, and we naturally ask, how the hell do they know? <laughs> Have they actually done a study? Has there been a survey to prove that it really is legal tender? And the answer, of course, is uh, they make it legal tender by declaring it to be legal tender. So all of these things are created by what I call status function declarations, where you make something a case by representing it as being the case. Language is the fundamental human institution in, 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 the, in a very deep sense that we can make precise, namely all other institutions presuppose language because all of the institutional facts about money and government and universities and cocktail parties require status function declarations where you make something the case by representing it as being the case. Uh, okay, now I want to get, uh, I hope I left myself enough time to give a to discuss, uh, discussion of human freedoms, which is what I'm driving at. Okay, <laughs> now... <laughs> First of all, I, as I said, I, want, I like the freedoms as opposed to freedom because then you force yourself to say which freedoms exactly you're going to be talking about. Uh, and it seems to me the freedoms worth having are those that are worth guaranteeing with a human right. And indeed, uh, we now have a tradition that goes back to the Enlightenment of universal human rights. Now, what on earth is a human, universal human right, and how do we create such things? Well, uh, and again, uh, uh, because in interest of time, I'm going to uh, state this briefly, just so I, can, I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining it. Uh, the idea is this. The genius of the Enlightenment philosophers is that they got the idea that in X counts as Y, you can treat being human as a Y status function. So uh, normally, you have rights in virtue of some other institution you're involved in. As the owner of property, you have, rights of, uh, you have property rights. As a citizen of the United States, you have voting rights. But somebody got the great idea that just being a human was a Y status function and consequently, human rights could attach to that status function. Now, how did they get away with it? It's absolutely astounding to me because, for example, my favorite declaration, and the guys might as well have read my book because they use my terminology, or maybe they got there first, is called the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and they sat down. Here, it's an amazing thing. You see, a bunch of the king's subjects, these guys weren't citizens of anywhere. They were subjects of King George III, and they sat down in Philadelphia, of all places, and simply declared themselves to be a country. They had no authority to do that. They performed a status function declaration that simply made it the case by declaration uh, that they had a new country then and there. 
How did they get away with it? Well, it took a certain amount of military force, and it didn't really work until they defeated Cornwallis at Yorktown. And by the way, some of the Americans tend to forget they couldn't have done it without help from the French. Without, there wouldn't be any United States without help from the French. But in any case, they did create this system of status functions, including the notion of human rights. Now, unfortunately, they had a false theory about human rights, and I'm now going to try to correct it. In our tradition, the mistake is to think we have rights the same way we have noses on our faces. Uh, It's just God gave them to us. Uh, God gave us noses, and so he gave us rights. Uh, That won't work for a number of reasons. Uh, But among them, even if it were the case, the rights would only function as rights to the the effect that they were treated as status functions, as treated as uh, uh, operating through collective acceptance or collective intentionality. Okay, so now let's ask the question. Suppose we were asked to justify the idea that being a human is itself a status function and as such the bearer of deontic powers and in particular the bearer of human rights. How would we justify that? What justification could we offer? And we're we're not allowed to cheat. We're not allowed to cheat and say, well, it says in the Constitution that we got these rights or God gave us these rights. No, we have to be able to justify it as 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 a designing feature of human institutions. Uh, There are two things wrong with the discussion of human rights in the United States. One is Americans think the discussion stops with the Constitution. Uh, uh, Why do I have the right to keep a rifle in my house? Second Amendment. Uh, What's wrong with slavery? Violates the 13th Amendment. Well, of course, uh, all of that's useful uh, in argument, but in fact, it's not philosophically satisfactory. We have to be able to justify it any claim for human rights. So let's do it. Let's try it. Let's take something we all accept, the the right to free speech. What's the justification for that? Uh, It's not enough to say, well, it's guaranteed by the First Amendment. Uh, And uh, even worse than that, there are utilitarian attempts to justify the right to free speech. Uh, Mills on liberty is the most famous, but it's very unsatisfactory for reasons that I could go into in the discussion if anybody wants me to. The argument for human rights is very simple. We are a certain sort of being. We are certain kinds of expressive animal. We are, in my jargon, speech act performing animals. It's in our essential nature that we like to express ourselves. And any theory of human rights has to start with human nature. And it's in our nature uh, to be cognitive animals, to be speech act performing animals. Now let me uh, uh, pause here to say (laughs) appeals to human nature are regarded as disreputable nowadays because there's a long uh, and sordid history of bad appeals to human nature. And furthermore, as I said earlier, uh, we now know we're continuous with other animal species. All that's true, but nonetheless, there are certain important distinctive features about human beings. And we perform speech acts in ways unknown even to my dog Tarski. Uh, we, I mean, he can bark occasionally and communicate things, but he does not give lectures on social ontology. Uh, and the, the characteristic of human beings, that expressiveness is essential, to, is given by their biological nature. It's part of human nature that we seek to express ourselves. Now, you might say, yeah, but there are lots of things that are part of human nature, but we don't want them acknowledged as human rights. I take it uh, that it's biologically uh, based, uh, that adolescent males like to beat up on other adolescent males, normally in competition for adolescent females. Uh, But that's not something that is worth recognizing as a human right. So in addition to human nature, you've got to have a value system. You've got to be able to say there's something especially valuable about our uh, 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 tendency uh, to speak, our tendency to express ourselves. Uh, and I think that is right. I think that the, uh, the keys to getting an inventory of, of universal human rights are that you have to have a conception of what's, what human beings are and what's valuable in human life. Now, immediately, I have to say, we need a distinction between negative rights and positive rights. Uh, negative rights just mean you have a right to be left alone. Why is distinction? Positive rights mean, no, we all have an obligation to do something positive for somebody. Why is that distinction important? Well, every right 
has an opposite in an obligation on somebody. If I have a right to park my car in your driveway, then you have an obligation not to interfere with my parking my car, and so on generally with rights. The difficulty with universal human rights is they place an obligation on everybody. If we recognize there's a universal human right to free speech, then we recognize that we're all under an obligation to let other people ex express their right to free speech. But recently there's grown up a theory that in addition to these negative rights like freedom of movement and freedom of speech, there are positive rights. And the worst document here uh, is the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights where they list a lot of poverty, a lot of positive rights and I think they haven't thought about this. So if they say, for example, everybody has a right to adequate housing. Oh, really? And who's going to pay for all of that? And how, where does this right come from? You see, I think it's perfectly legitimate to say everybody has a right to seek adequate housing or individual uh, political institutions. Uh, the government of the state of California might say uh, everybody in California uh, should have adequate housing and we recognize that in the law. But the idea that all human beings everywhere are under an obligation to provide adequate housing for all human beings everywhere seems to me not a reasonable claim. I don't, think, I don't think you can make a claim for positive rights of the kind you can make for negative rights. The only positive right that I can think of that I would accept uh, is the idea that we all have a positive human right to life and survival. What that means by way of obligation is if you see somebody dying and you can save him, you are under an obligation and indeed he has a right to expect you to help him to survive. But the idea that we're all under a, a positive obligation to provide adequate housing for everybody on earth, that seems to me unreasonable. So let's make a distinction between positive and negative rights. And I want to say the rights that I think are valid, with this one exception, are all negative rights. The first one I listed was the right to free speech, but that's part of a much larger right, which I will call cognitive rights, which is the right to free speech and expression, uh, and I think to investigation. I think we all have a right to investigate uh, freely. There was a period in the dreadful 1990s when it was said, well, we shouldn't investigate such things as are there gender differences in cognitive uh, capacities or are there uh, racial and ethnic differences in cognitive capacity. That seems to me exactly the kind of thing we ought to be investigating. Uh, and certainly we, we have a right to undertake such investigations. Okay, so we got one right, uh, which I will call a cognitive rights, which includes uh, speech, writing, uh, and investigation, generally, uh, the exercise of our cognitive capacities. And uh, it, it used to be said that uh, the uh, right uh, freedom of press really is meaningless unless you own a newspaper. Well, guess what? We all own a newspaper. It's called the Internet. Uh, I gave a lecture in uh, Switzerland. It wasn't a great lecture. Uh, I, you know, it's uh, called a TED lecture, and you only got 15 minutes, and you can't do much in 15 minutes. A million people have watched this damn lecture. It slightly embarrasses me that a million people have watched it. My, I, I, I have the Oxford conception of the ideal class. The ideal class consists of a, a course in the philosophy of, taught, um, philosophy of mathematics taught by Alfred North Whitehead and has one student, Bertrand Russell. That's the ideal <laughs> class. <laughs> Anything beyond that is a vulgarization. But in any case, you don't have to worry about freedom of the press, you have access to a press. Uh, I dread the thought of another blog, and I hope I don't end up setting up one, but all people have ways of communicating now that are quite unlike anything in history. Okay, second basic human right, I think, is the right to move around on the surface of the earth. I, I was struck by this when I visited the Soviet Union, and this first time was in 1971. And I'm, gonna, I'm a Californian. I got a car. I can go anywhere. No, you can't. You cannot go anywhere in the Soviet Union. You're stopped every few miles on a highway, and they want to know what authorized you to be here, even in the city of Moscow uh, or, or St. Peter, which then was called Leningrad. Uh, you're stopped, uh, at, at really, a matter of every so many blocks uh, where they uh, check your papers. So freedom of movement. Now, that has to be stated precisely. 
It doesn't mean we have to admit everybody who wants to come here, but it does mean that everybody ha should have a right to move around freely in their own country and to try to travel abroad as much as uh, the uh, possessors of other territories in the world are willing to allow them. No, you, no nation should restrict its own citizens' right to travel. Okay, I don't want to try to give you a whole inventory of human rights, but let me just mention a few more. Now, the interesting thing about these two, the freedom of uh, cognition and the freedom of movement, is they presuppose the most fundamental human right of all, but nobody ever mentions it uh, because it's not normally challenged. And that's the right to make such simple bodily movements, scratch my head, wiggle my thumbs, do what I want. And that, I think, is the most fundamental human right, the ability to control your own body. But uh, since it's uh, usually not challenged, I don't know of any case where the authorities have challenged it, you won't see it listed in any standard list of human rights. Now, a fourth human right I want to mention is the right to make use of the resources that are available. Um, and right now, that means the technological resources. And some nations, perhaps China more than any other, find it useful to restrict that right. There's all these capacities that we have that previous uh, generations have not had. And I think we ought to recognize that human beings have a right to make use of such things as travel by jet planes and, and uh, I, I, use of computers. <laughs> Okay, I move on quickly because I want to just get through a small inventory and then we'll stop for discussion. Now, a crucial human right, and I think it qualifies as a universal human right, and it is one that is challenged right now, and that's the right to privacy. Um, I, your right to privacy is threatened every time you get on the Internet because people are um, uh, keeping data about you. And I don't think this is inevitable. I think we ought to insist that they can only keep this data and use it with your permission. Now, there is another thing even closer to home, and that's this. I'm told that I have no right to the privacy of my email, that the university can access that any time they like. I think that's an outrage. And the argument is, well, they paid for the electricity. Come on, and they paid for the electricity. That's like saying, well, uh, the files in my filing cabinet, the university ought to have a right to go to those filing cabinets any time they want because they paid for the paper. Well, forget it. I'll give them a nickel for the paper. Uh, and, the, and the idea that my private email, see, I have a private account in addition to my university account, but I'm told even that the university can access uh, because I, I often access it from my office, and I think this is an invasion of privacy. I think we ought to recognize that individual students and faculty members should have complete privacy of their email, and they have complete privacy of their journals or the contents of their wallet or the, all the boring papers in my filing cabinet. So the rights of privacy are threatened pretty much everywhere, uh, and we're not really aware of it. We come to accept it or take it for granted. Okay, well, one last one I'll mention is the right of uh, freedom of association, and I really mean uh, freedom of association. It is amazing to think uh, the uh, restrictions that were placed on homosexuality uh, as recently as 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, an awful lot of these were in my lifetime. Uh, Britain managed to drive its most brilliant single uh, intellectual of the time, Alan Turing. He was driven to suicide uh, simply because uh, he was made to suffer uh, for his sexual preferences. I mention that as one example, but it seems to me we ought to have complete right of association, of personal association of any kind. Okay. Now, the, there are a couple of complexities, though, to this account I'm giving you. And again, how much time I got? Just a couple of minutes. Okay, a couple of minutes. Uh, the temptation is to think, look, if you want to do something and it doesn't interfere with anybody else, you ought to have a right to do it. Uh, and I think other things equal that's right. But that presupposes something that's not universally true. And that is we're talking about uh, self-aware, rational adults in possession of their faculties. And there are two possible counterexamples of that. One is prostitution and the other is drugs. Uh, if somebody wants to sell his or her body, why shouldn't they have a right to do that like any other? It's a, a right of freedom. The difficulty is that most of the actual cases are not 
uh, rational adults making a rational decision, uh, they're bewildered children, usually young girls, uh, being manipulated uh, by older men. And in the case of drugs, uh, it is, uh, the standard account is, if you take the really nasty kind of drugs, you take heroin and cocaine, it destroys your capacity for free decision making. And that seems to me probably correct. But how about these uh, sordid but nonetheless uh, 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 essentially not too offensive drugs like marijuana? I may be the only guy in Berkeley that's never had marijuana. I, the whole, I find the uh, whole idea disgusting, not to say smelly. Um, and uh, the reason is not because I'm so law-abiding that I, I went to all these parties and thought, no, mustn't break the law. No, it's because, if you like, I'm too vain. I, I don't want to mess with my brain. A brain is a very precious organ to me, and I don't want to put stuff into it where we don't know the effects. You see, the thing about alcohol, uh, as bad as it is, we've had 5,000 years of drinking, so we have some idea of the effects of alcohol and how much is too little and how much is not, uh, how much is too much, and how, I know how, that was a Freudian slip, how much is too little, but uh, <laughs> how much is too much. Um, but. But the uh, point is, uh, we have no such tradition uh, where even the soft drugs are concerned. And I do find them, frankly, disgusting. I have an office that overlooks the creek, and pe people think they have wonderful privacy to go down there and smoke their disgusting weed. And, and I have to lean out the window and tell them in the most polite terms, well, I won't tell them what I think of it in the most polite terms, uh, but in any case, so I, I don't want to give the idea that uh, human rights are simple, that all I can do is just say, well, let people do what they want. No, it's much more complicated than that. Well. I have lots more to say, uh, but I think you've been a wonderful audience, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm glad you didn't eliminate alcohol because there's going to be wine at the reception. Uh, that was a brilliant lecture, and you know, I, I know that we're going to have great comments from Joshua Cohn, who has had the opportunity to read this beforehand and has prepared his own comments. Let me introduce Joshua Cohn. He's a political philosopher. He's written on issues of democracy, Global Justice. He studied philosophy at Yale and Harvard, got his PhD at Harvard from 1979, and for 10 years, 10 years, 30 years, almost, uh, 77 to 2006, he was professor of political science and philosophy at MIT. He then moved to Stanford, where he's Martha Sutton Weeks Professor of Ethics and Society. He has appointments in three departments, political science, philosophy, and law. He also teaches a course at Stanford's D School, the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design. The course is called Designing Liberation Technology. He is co-author of On Democracy and Associations in Democracy, author of Philosophy, Politics, Democracy, The Arc of the Moral Universe, and Rousseau, A Free Community of Equals, among others. And a very interesting thing, Oh, he's been editor since 1991 for the Boston Review, which is a great, great intellectual journal. And he has now been working at Apple University since 2011 and is currently dividing his time 50-50 between Apple and Stanford. So, Frank, the market and the academy do sometimes coincide. <laughs> Joshua, please. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, you also read what I wrote very well. Um, so I'm grateful to be able to serve as, uh, for the invitation to be commentator on John Searle's uh, Baxter lecture, especially with Ambassador Baxter here. It's a, a pleasure, really a pleasure, to have uh, the opportunity to comment on a, such a rich and interesting paper, uh, interesting and rich, and also as some of you may know, pure John Searle, uh, original uh, on a hugely important topic, uh, wide-ranging, 
and a kind of uh, ebulliently combative. Um, that's all good. <laughs> all good. And I'm going to make, um, make three points in my uh, comments. And I, before I make the points, I just want you to sympathize with my uh, dilemma. Um, you just heard the talk, and uh, it covered a number of different topics. Um, social ontology, deontic powers, desires, uh, institutions, rights, universal human rights, civilization, sex and drugs at the end. Um, so I, I, you know, I had to pick something to focus on, so I picked three things. You know, there were a bunch of, there were 30 or 40 that I could have, but anyway, I tried to pick some. Okay, so first point. So I completely agree with uh, John's idea that rights, including human rights, are best understood as institution dependent. And not institution dependent only because we need institutions to protect rights. We also need institutions to specify the content of the rights and the freedoms they protect. So consider rights of association. Uh, John's last example, including, as he puts it in the paper, political, aesthetic, sexual, and economic association. Now, if we think of uh, human rights as natural rights, and natural rights as rights that could or would exist in a pre-institutional state of nature, then it's hard to understand what that capacious right of association could possibly mean. But it's not best to think of human rights as natural, uh, at least not in that familiar institution independent sense of natural. Instead, think of rights institutionally. Now, in the paper, this point about rights is part of a broader observation, which John didn't really emphasize in the lecture, though I think it's fair to say it's emphasized in the paper, which is the idea that institutions are enabling, uh, you know, empowering, to use a familiar term, not simply limiting or constraining. But uh, I think John's way of making this point about institutions as enabling, as power creating, is too narrow. He emphasizes, as he said uh, in the talk put right on the board, um, he emphasizes normative enablements that institutions create, as he calls them, deontic powers, rights, permissions, duties, which give people uh, reasons for action that are alternative to instinct. And then, voila, we have civilization. Now, I'd add, uh, here following a vast literature in political economy, that institutions are functionally enabling as well as normatively enabling. They not only give people rights and obligations and authority, they enable people de facto to do stuff together that they can't do separately. And I, I think that has something to do with civilization, too. Uh, now, the precise relationship between normative and functional enablings, that's a big issue, uh, which I, and I'll simply leave it here. So that's a first point. Second point, as you heard in the lecture, John is dismissive of the idea of positive human rights generally dismissive because he makes an exception for a basic right to, for a right to basic assistance needed for survival but otherwise human rights are all negative now you know I'm a philosopher too I like distinctions too but I don't trust this negative positive distinction but I'm not going to report on that general skepticism um, Premising the distinction, John thinks human rights are rights of non-interference uh, associated with obligations of others not to interfere. Now, I want to resist his skepticism about positive rights. Now, I want to, to, in resisting the skepticism, I want to observe first that that skepticism about positive rights is not required by John's general theory about the nature of rights or his theory about universal human rights. According to the general theory, you just heard it, rights are status functions. According to the theory of universal human rights, being human is itself treated as a status function. 
an aside here, I do find that idea puzzling because the paper defines a function as a cause that serves a purpose, and I, I don't see how that fits human beings. And maybe there's some story about agent causation at work. Anyway, I said it's an aside. I'm going to leave it on the side. Anyway, the line of thinking go, whose line of thinking goes something like this. The idea that rights are status functions means very roughly that counting someone as a property owner, for example, consists in recognizing him or her as having certain rights, which means, at the same time, recognizing others as having obligations corresponding to these rights and understanding that those others have reasons to act on those obligations. Similarly, the idea that being human is a status function means that counting someone as human consists in part in recognizing that person as having a bunch of rights. And, once again, that requires recognizing others as having obligations corresponding to these rights and understanding that those others have reasons to act on those obligations. Now, that's fine, uh, but I don't think that any of that requires giving up on positive human rights. So consider, for example, and I didn't pick this example because of Ambassador Baxter's interest in education. It just happens to be a happy convergence between the example I picked and uh, your interest. So consider a right to basic education. I basic education, I mean education, say, sufficient for literacy and numeracy. Now that education bears an intimate relationship to the universal human rights that John refers to as rights of cognition. He proposes that we have rights of cognition because the activities those rights protect are roughly really valuable parts of human nature. So once we're treating humanness as a status function, we have a case for treating those rights, rights of cognition, as part of the status of being human. Now the availability of education sufficient at least for numeracy and literacy is intimately connected to the interests that lie at the basis of those rights of cognition. Consider, for example, the interest in forming convictions and expressing those convictions. That interest is well served both by the absence of sanctions on people imposed because of what they say, the negative side of it, and also well served by access to favorable conditions for forming convictions and developing the basic capacities required for expressing those convictions. Education is among those favorable conditions. So why reject this right? Well, maybe you reject it because you have some view that all human rights are negative, but John doesn't have that view, um, as he said. Now, I think I think that there are two distinct objections that he has to a basic human, a human right to basic education, what I'll call an indeterminacy objection and an impossibility objection. The indeterminacy objection begins by observing that rights are associated with obligations. In the case of negative rights, the obligations are assumed to be clear. John has a right to bodily integrity, correspondingly, I have an obligation not to get in his face. Game, set, match. But in the case of positive rights, we don't have a grip. This is the indeterminacy objection. In the case of positive rights, we don't have a grip on the content of the obligations that others have. I mean, if everyone in the world has a right to basic education, what am I obligated to do? Well, you know, one answer is that I'm obligated to support and uphold decent institutions here and elsewhere. Those institutions have the principal responsibility for ensuring the protection of basic rights. The fact that there is a right gives me a strong reason for doing what I can to support and uphold those institutions. A strong reason in a way that I don't have a strong reason to ensure that people have what it would be nice for them to have. Of course, working out precisely what I ought to do requires judgment on my part. But I, I think that requirement of judgment extends to negative rights, too, uh, because there, too, I arguably have obligations to support the relevant institutions. 
Okay, so that's the indeterminacy objection. I think there's a second objection that I, it's the impossibility objection. Pre here the problem is not that the obligations are indeterminate. Who knows what I'm obligated to do? The problem is that they determinately cannot be fulfilled because the means, including organizational capacity, is simply, the means are simply unavailable. Now, I have similar concerns about this objection. I mean, the role of the idea of universal human rights is in part to provide some kind of practical guidance. So I develop an understanding of the hurdles to ensuring a right to basic education. That understanding of those hurdles doesn't defeat the right because the an understanding of the hurdles doesn't show that basic education lacks the kind of importance that I think fundamental ri human rights have. Instead, my understanding of the hurdles to achieving that right help to guide my efforts at their realization. And I think once more the same can be said about other human rights as well. So the first point was, uh, John, I think, has the, the right idea about rights being institution dependent but unnecessarily circumscribes um, the role of institutions, focuses on normative powers or its de facto powers as well. That's the first point. Both important for civilization. Second, I mean, insofar as I understand civilization, I think they're both important. Uh, second point is I'm kind of skeptical about this. Uh, the, the, I'm skeptical about the skepticism about all the rights with this one little exception exception being negative. Final point is, for better or worse, more the most philosophical. So the basis of human rights, John says, is that being human is itself a status function. That's a quote from the paper. Now, creating status functions, that counting X as Y, that's something, John says, that that's something that we do. And now I'm wondering in the case of human rights, who's the we that's doing that status function counting as this as that? Now one answer to that question, an unworkable answer, but uh, good to understand that it's unworkable, is that we, the creator of those, is a collectivity with a deontic power, namely the the, here's the deontic power, the authority to create other deontic powers, including the human rights. Now, that won't do. I think it's pretty obvious why it won't do, because the question then arises, where did that deontic power come from that made us, gave us the authority? Who's the we behind the we? Does it, so that one won't do. Instead, and here, this is what I'm going to say is based on other things that John has written, I think John's answer is something like this. The we that makes it true that an X is a Y, it makes it true that an X is a Y by counting an X as a Y. That's how you make it true. You count it and that, ah, so voila, it's true. The we that makes it true that an X is a Y by counting an X as a Y is a collection of individuals who converge on certain kinds of attitudes, uh, call them we attitudes, which are roughly beliefs and intentions on the part of the, held by the members of that set, beliefs and intentions about what members of that collection believe and are prepared to do. The collection of individuals with those convergent we attitudes is a status function conferring we, in virtue, simply in virtue of that convergence of attitudes with a special content, those we attitudes. That's the general theory. How does it apply to universal human rights? Uh, well, uh, the application is something like this. There is some collection of people people with no further interdependences or mutual responsiveness among them, a collection itself bereft of deontic powers, that members of that collection converged in a certain we attitude about the significance of being human. 
Now, I have three questions about this view, and then I'll, which I will conclude with. The first question is, well, this collection of with people with convergent attitudes doesn't include everybody. So who exactly is in the collection, and how could it be that that collection of individuals turned being human into a status function? I mean, they could have declared it, but you know, they didn't win the battle at, against General Cornwallis. Or maybe they did. Maybe that was what world, I, I don't know. Anyway, so who exactly is in that collection, and how could that collection, by having these convergent attitudes, transform being human into a status function? Second question. If we think of human rights as moral rights, how could those rights be conferred by this de facto convergence of attitudes among individuals who, as a collection, have no deontic powers at all, much less the normative power to create moral rights? I mean, remember, that was the first proposal, was that maybe this, the we is some, they got the, it's a group that has the authority. Well, they can't. No, 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 you need another we. So there's some we that doesn't itself have deontic power. Convergence of attitudes cre uh, uh, turns being human into a status function and establishes more moral rights. Well, if human rights are moral rights, I don't, I'm not quite understanding how that de facto convergence yields the rights. Last point is this. The proponents of the idea of human rights thought of themselves as recognizing rights, not as urging their conferral through convergent attitudes. I suppose they urged the convergence of attitudes because they thought they were these rights of people. So I wonder if there's a tension between the we attitudes that play a role, those convergent we attitudes that play a role in John's theory, and the actual views that, as an historical matter, led to the spread of the idea of human rights. Thank you. Really an intellectual feast of ideas on both sides. Thank you, Josh, very much. So we want to give people in the audience a chance to ask questions. But I thought that John should have the opportunity to say just a couple of things in response. He said he wanted yeah. just a minute or two. Yeah. And then I'll call on people with questions from the audience. OK, well, I'm very grateful uh, uh, for Josh's comments. And I might say that's philosophy at its best. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I'm going to pick the most philosophical part. Don't you get an infinite regress? I, philosophers love infinite yeah, regresses. Yeah. If you got all these guys getting together, uh, imposing, uh, creating deonic powers by collective intentionality, where the hell did they get the deonic power to do that, you see? And my favorite example is the Declaration of Independence. They had no authority whatever to declare themselves to be a separate country. How did they get away with it? The answer is they got people to accept it. They got uh, people generally to accept it. Now, uh, as we know, uh, four score uh, years later, uh, uh, they were imitated in, I think, Richmond by a bunch of people who declared the Confederate States of America. Didn't work so well. Um, so success is not guaranteed. You have to get people to accept it. Uh, and the, the free speech movement is what inspired a lot of my reflections about this because a rather ragtag group of people with a few uh, faculty allies managed in overthrowing the authority of the uh, uh, duly constituted University of California in Berkeley. I have to say it got slightly out of hand, in my opinion. I, I, it mustn't exaggerate, as the French say, and, and we did slightly exaggerate. Uh, and what happened was we discovered, or I discovered at least, that on the one hand, the institutions are very fragile. Uh, uh, you can uh, withdraw. Uh, the acceptance of the status functions. On the other hand, there is a sheer bureaucratic inertia that manages to enable the institution to keep surviving. Uh, so uh, uh, budgets and paychecks manages uh, to survive a great deal of rhetorical assault on the very authority of the university. So there isn't any simple answer to how does it work except to say 
if you can get people to accept it and go along with it and make sacrifices for it, then you, and you get a lot, enough people to do that, you have a, a status function in operation. And that can be, uh, be with a ski club or a university or a whole country. Uh, so that there isn't any answer to the uh, avoiding the infinite regress argument. Now, uh, the second a, a deep point he made was about uh, moral rights and justification. I suggested that if you're going to justify the idea of individual uh, 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 human rights as universals, you have to do it in terms of a combination of a theory of human nature and a theory of value, what's valuable in human na nature. And this doesn't guarantee uh, the existence of the right. It gives you, a, 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 at its best, it gives you a justification uh, for insisting uh, that there should be such a right and that the right uh, should be recognized. Uh, and finally, uh, he's right uh, historically that the human rights work best when people thought that having a human right is like having a nose on your face. It's just a, a brute fact about you. It's totally observer independent, and it has nothing to do with anybody's attitude. Uh, that's an attractive view, but it's false. Uh, human rights only works if there is a collective recognition or acceptance, and I'm urging uh, that we should face up to that fact and face up uh, to its implications. From, a, from my point of view, from a rhetorical point of view, the worst thing about the FSM is that my most effective argument was the worst argument. The most effective argument was students should have the same constitutional rights on the campus as they have in the community at large. And it's very easy to get Americans to accept that. I don't, I, and of course it's perfectly valid, they should, but it's not a good argument. Universities should set their own philosophical standards and then make the rest of the community uh, abide by that. When I worked in the administration, my attitude is figure out what we want to do and then get the lawyers to find a legal way for us to do it. And typically the lawyers would say, well, there's no legal way. Fine, we're going to do it anyway. You find a legal way for me to do what I'm going to do anyway. That is the attitude that universities ought to have. They ought to set their own standards. They shouldn't just go along with the uh, community standards. But what I found was in America, the Constitution is kind of the ultimate uh, court of appeal. I think that's a philosophical mistake, and I find it unsatisfying. There are other points he made, but I will uh, uh, throw this open to the discussion. I think it's more important to get questions from the floor. Okay, we have mics, so if people would want to ask a question, they'll get a mic, and we hand it to you, please, if I may, so in the interest of getting as many questions as possible, if we could make each one relatively succinct. Thank you. Professor Searle, um, very nice lecture, but I was surprised not to hear any talk or much talk about conflict. In other words, my freedom impinges yeah, on your freedom, right. and so on. And, and it seems to have been left out. Two cases in point, when you talk about uh, freedom of speech, what about yeah. hate speech? When you talk about uh, freedom of association, what about student demonstrations, right. or worse, uh, demonstrations they grève in France? Right. Okay, I appreciate this, because that was a section in the paper yeah. where I addressed this. I, I couldn't say everything that was in the paper. Uh, now, Americans make another mistake, and that is to suppose... If the right to free speech, for example, can be overridden by some other considerations, that shows that it wasn't an absolute right. I think that's a mistake. Two absolute rights can conflict with each other. My right to free expression and your right to life and safety, for example, can easily conflict, or all sorts of other conflicts uh, can arise. Uh, so it doesn't show that a right is not an absolute right that can be overridden by other considerations. And that's certainly the case with all the rights that I mentioned. Other considerations can override them. And there's no algorithm uh, for deciding, well, under what conditions exactly should they be overridden. We hire lawyers and judges uh, to try to decide these issues, but generally they do an imperfect job at best. Uh, but we ha you have to have good faith in deciding, well, what is a reasonable consideration? Now, the, uh, the danger always is you go along with whatever is politically prevailing. If it's uh, the political correct view is to think, well, you shouldn't really be able to express your opinions about uh, all sorts of, of uh, social issues, uh, then I, I think that is a sacrifice of the right to free speech. The right to free speech is an absolute right, but it can conflict with all sorts of other equally absolute rights. <coughs> a conditional right would be, for example, my right to cross-examine witnesses against me. And that is conditional on me being in a court trial. But if somebody says something rude about me on the plaza, I have no right uh, to uh, cross-examine him. Now, another mistake that Americans make, and you'd be surprised how common this is, is to suppose 
that if you have a right to do something, then it's okay to do it. It doesn't follow that it's okay to do it. Many of the exercises of free speech are stupid, irrelevant, boring, illogical, or just plain dumb. Um, and that doesn't mean that they don't have a right to do it. It just means not a right thing to do. So this is a, a common mistake. I, if I just, this is a very small point that it was something that struck me in the paper, in this part of the paper. And, you know, I'm sure you've had this experience. You make a point in a conversation and someone says, that's just the semantic point. Mm -hmm. And you say, what do you mean, just? Mm -hmm. Just the semantic point. You know? uh, at MIT, I was in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy. It's, um, so you say uh, about this issue, as you just said now, that um, the fact that these rights come into conflict and one has to give doesn't mean that the rights aren't absolute. And mm -hmm. I don't really, I don't think I understand what that means. I mean, it seems like a yeah. funny terminological thing. It means thing. absolute I mean, as opposed to conditional. Um, well, but, uh, I mean, absolute, well, it's, okay. like, it's the end of the discussion. As yeah. I, th it's, this is purely, this is like just, purely a terminological thing. I think yeah. it would be better to avoid saying, yes, they're absolute, but yeah. they've got to give. Okay, let me, uh, <laughs> let me situate <laughs> the history of this. <laughs> uh, if you live through uh, fights over free speech like the FSM, yeah. the standard answer given by the university authorities, well, you have to admit the right to free speech is an absolute, yeah. uh, whereupon they follow with a whole bunch of restrictions they want to place. Yeah. So I rhetorically, I, I, I could have said categorical rather yeah. than absolute. But it was rhetorically important at a certain phase of history to insist that they're absolute, which means that they're, they're, they're categorical, they're not hypothetical. I wouldn't call them absolute, but anyway, it's just a semantic <clears throat> point. John, you mentioned the right to privacy and uh, reminded us that it's under threat. I'm wondering uh, how you would respond to somebody like Eric Schmidt or one of the other executives of Google if they said in the context of American liberties that they have a liberty to use the information that they glean in this business that consumers voluntarily, voluntarily yeah. participate in. So if we're going to defend the right to privacy as you have done it, how would we respond to that libertarian yeah. argument from the entrepreneurs? Yeah. Well, the argument is, look, I've got this information, so I'm free to use it as I want. That's the argument. The question is, how did you get this information? And I'm suggesting that they should only be allowed to use information uh, if uh, they have our permission to use the information. And the temptation is to say, well, you voluntarily used Google. You know, you didn't have to use Google. You didn't have to go on the Internet. The fact is, a lot of things are not really optional today. You can't live without being on the internet. You can't live without email. You can't, I don't, maybe you can avoid Google and maybe other uh, search engines, but so you got to use some search engine or other. These have become part of contemporary life, and I should, I think we should recognize them as potential threats to privacy. Josh? I, I, I'm half employed at Apple. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay. <laughs> Tony? Uh, I'm not going to speak to this issue. <laughs> <laughs> John, there are people. I mean, as John said, the fact that I have a right to do it doesn't mean that it's wise for me to do it. I mean, I could say something moronic and stupid, but um, no. <laughs> um, there are people out there, and maybe even some in here, who think that animals have rights. Yeah, oh, that's if, a good one. I'm sure you get this question all the time. So, but if they do, if you think they do, do they have them only as a function of human civilization? Yes. What I uh, want to claim is I, I think animals do have rights, but the interesting thing is their rights will become recognized only by humans. Uh, we will create a system of animal rights only as humans um, using uh, the, uh, the apparatus of status functions. Uh, I think my doggy has rights. Why? Well, he has a possibility of a good life and he can suffer pain. Uh, and uh, he has a right to at least the, the opportunity to have a good life and not to suffer needless uh, pain. But the interesting from this point of view, from uh, this discussion, is all of that has to be created by human beings. So I think there are animal rights. There are status functions created by humans. There's something I'm, I, I, the, I didn't raise in the comments, but I'm puzzled about it. There, um, so there are two kinds of things that happen in the paper in the discussion of universal human rights. And this case brings it out. So on the one hand, there's a question, 
One question is, there, are there any universal human rights? And the answer to that question is, yes, there are, and the answer is given by the status function. Mm -hmm. Then there's a separate column, as far as I understood this, because there's this separate thing, which is, okay, people, what exactly are those rights? And then that's where you say something, well, you need a theory about human nature, and, and not just about what's natural to people, because there are the teenage boys getting into fights, uh, about teenage girls and anything else they can get into a fight about. Uh, so, but, so it's got to be good, you know, so there's a human nature story and something about valuable expressions of human nature. Um, and that, I, as I understood it in the paper, is your way of saying what belongs to the list of human rights, um, but not, but the fact that there is a human nature and that there are compellingly valuable expressions of it doesn't itself suffice to establish that there are human rights. Is that, is yeah, that the, yeah. Yeah, well, is that the me, structure? No, let me uh, state yeah, it uh, yeah. somewhat differently. Your idea is there are really two separate structures. There are all these human rights, and then there's a question is, well, what should go on the list? That's not the way I structure yeah. the argument. The argument is this. It is characteristic of status functions yeah. that the status function is justified by the purpose of the institution. Uh, and how it relates to other institutions. So this, the laws of property have to show how property relates to other institutions. Yeah. The laws of citizenship has to show how it relates to other institutions. Now, if you treat being a human being as an institutional fact, as a, as a why term, yeah. then if you're going to give a list of deontic powers, you're going to give a list of rights that go with yeah. being a human being, yeah. you have to be able to justify the items on the list. So there isn't that, it isn't that there are two, there's two questions. One is, what's the list and what's the justification? That's the same uh, a question for me. What is the justification for us assigning rights to human beings just in virtue of being human? And I say there are two steps to that. You've got to figure out what it means to be a human, yeah. and you've got to figure out which of the things that it means to be a human are worth preserving, are worth defending. So yeah. there's an axiology. There's a, a set of evaluations. But then, then I don't so understand. So I think the way you describe it is not the way that I structure it. Yeah, the, I don't understand then the, the criticism that you make of what you regard as the conventional view, um, which is that uh, there are certain facts about human beings in virtue of which they are entitled to these rights. So, um, and so if you didn't have the status function around, there would be a very good justification for having the status function around, namely that there, is a, that there are these compellingly valuable expressions of um, human nature. So it's not just like um, you know, at some point people thought, you know, there was this convergence of attitudes and that resulted in the creation of a status function and then there were human rights and then you figure out what, it's that there was a rationale, the very same rationale for thinking that there's a right to cognitive function on the list of human rights, that was a reason for creating that status in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that strikes me as much closer to traditional justifications of human rights like Mills, in jo yeah. John Stuart Mills in Chapter 5 of One Liberty yeah. than you suggested. Yeah, I don't think that is a correct interpretation. I think yeah. it is certainly uh, the case that we have to create uh, human rights and assign them to human beings. Yeah. The question is we don't do it out of the blue. We yeah. do it in virtue of the purpose of the institution here, to speak uh, metaphorically. But we don't have the institution yet, and we're trying to justify having the institution. Yeah. And I say, so here are these facts, okay. the, the facts that you use to justify there are cognitive rights, for example. Those facts are available antecedently. Yeah. That provides a rationale for having the institution in the first place. Yes, no, but that seems to me perfectly reasonable. That okay. is to say, yeah. we have a certain conception of human beings, which yeah. justifies and treating them as a wide term. Yeah. But you then have to spell it out.
Okay. It's not enough to say humans are dignified yeah, yeah. or they uh, they have a, a certain I, uh, a cognitive capacity. You then have to spell it out, and the spelling out requires justification. For each right, you then have to say, why do you have that right? And I suggested there's a yeah. certain general form of yeah. that justification. Yeah. You've got to state what it is to be a human being and what's valuable about human beings. I beings. agree completely okay. about that, and one thing that I dropped out at the last minute from the comments on the paper was just, my comments were, was reporting that the idea that you should talk about liberties in the plural rather than liberty in this completely abstract yeah. way seems to be exactly right. Yeah. I have no blue sky on that issue at all. Okay. Hi. Um, it, it, it seems to me, and I want to ask the, the both of you, um, if an implication of this would be that if uh, a few generations from now, people decided that it wasn't a human right to be um, to have uh, to be have a right to your own bodily integrity or to have free speech, and that they they made this why declaration that in fact it was not a right that that right would disappear. It, it, does it depend on, I mean, it seems like this generation's exactly happening now that the younger generation has less of a um, purchase on the right to uh, um, privacy than perhaps our generation would have. So it's not an academic thing. Yeah. Well, that's a very, uh, shall I start? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, that's a very deep uh, question. Um, and at some deep level, I think the factual uh, claim is the same. If I say the right to free speech has always existed, but it only became recognized at the time of the Enlightenment, or to say that the right to free speech came in existence at the time of the Enlightenment, because what we're saying in both cases is that the justification for the assignment of that right is permanent, but it was only acknowledged at the time of the Enlightenment. Now, we talk as if all this stuff was very simple and it's uh, easy to get all this done. But remember, it is constantly under threat. Uh, the whole system is constantly under threat. At the time, before Hitler, it was said probably correctly that the Germans are the best educated people in the world. You go back and look at the slogans, and they're all attacks on human rights. Du bist nichts, dein Volk ist alles. You're nothing. Your people is everything. Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. One uh, 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 people, uh, one uh, nation, one leader, and so on. I won't go through the whole litany of uh, Sprich Deutsch, Denk Deutsch, Sei Deutsch. All of these were attacks on human individual individuality. So human individuality is constantly under threat, uh, and it requires constant defense. And that's what I'm trying to do is to provide uh, a theoretical basis for the defense. Now, it's... Uh, as is often the case in philosophy, uh, defenses are more effective if they're false. Uh, and, and I think uh, the false defense is you're, you got a, a rights the way God knows us. God gave you a right, and that's that. End of the story. Uh, God gave you the rights, and there they are. Uh, unfortunately, God keeps changing her mind because in the initial formulation, she didn't give any rights to women, and she only gave three-fifths of a right to, to blacks. So it's not going to work. Uh, to say that uh, you got rights because God gave you other rights. You have to have a more intelligent basis, and that's what I'm trying to provide. Yeah. Um, on the generational issue, I, I, I would guess, uh, I, I'm not sure that I agree about the generational point. I mean, that's not essential to your question. I expect that there are going to be a lot of uh, uh, young engineers. That's not the entire generation, but there are going to be a lot of engineers who are going to spend a huge amount of time over the next few years, huge amount of time and energy investing in encryption technologies because of the privacy issue. Maybe that's just wishful thinking, but anyway, um, I don't want to retract what I said before that I'm not going to speak to this issue because of my, I don't want to speak as a, an employee of a company that's invested in it. But I think that the, uh, I think the question you're asking goes exactly to the issue that we were just talking about, which is whether or not I, the, th there's a suggestion, I think, in John's discussion of status functions and their creation that the, and it, my interpretation of it, that they're a product of a con de facto convergence of certain kinds of attitudes uh, that I think suggests 
that when the attitudes diverge, um, the rights are gone. Not just that they're less well protected, but the rights are gone. And I was resisting that idea by saying that uh, the considerations that John uses to defend, for example, the idea that there are cognitive rights are considerations that you could use about human nature and valuable expressions of it that are considerations that you could use to defend the existence of the practice of recognizing human rights so that it's a less a matter of uh, uh, convention. Now, so that if, if should it happen that people drift far from it, I mean, I think you'd have to say, I would say now, they're making a mistake. Now, I want to be, they're doing something wrong. So I want to be careful about that, which is that um, the, and here we completely agree, you have to give a rationale and you give it for a bunch of these rights. And it might be that what happens is people come to see that the right of privacy was playing some kind of role that you no longer need the right of privacy uh, to play. So they learn some. Um, that's possible. I don't know what that is, but it's uh, possible. But I think the last exchange between us, I was trying to suggest that there's at least a suggestion in the paper of a less conventionalist story, if I can put it that way, about the nature of uh, human rights, and I was maybe urging its um, adoption. I think yeah. we have time for yeah. one last question. I'm sorry, because... Well, there's a bunch of hands are up, but so, uh, two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for a very interesting talk. I was uh, intrigued by the title, Social Reality and Human uh, Freedoms and Rights. I was just wondering whether uh, rich people have uh, more rights and freedoms than others. Uh, and does it depend on mm -hmm. uh, the source of their wealth? Uh, what, yeah. what do you think of that? Uh, well, I, on the account that I gave you, uh, everybody as a human has the same rights. Now, I, I, the re resources you bring to bear are going to enable you to exercise your rights in different ways. Uh, and it used to be said, well, of course, the right of free speech, uh, the right of uh, 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 freedom of the press doesn't mean much if you don't own a newspaper. And technology actually has altered that. It's still, it's still a huge difference between people who own newspapers and people who don't. But we all have access to means of communication which were unknown to our grandparents' generation. So the short answer is rich people don't have any additional rights, but they certainly have more clout in exercising the rights that we all have. Yeah. One last question. Um, how would you characterize the um, difference in moral obligations towards someone else generated by the having a right to something yeah. compared to other types of moral obligation to someone you know, that, that, they, that you might have? Yeah. Well, uh, that's an interesting question in moral philosophy, and I really didn't uh, go into that. But it seems to me you need a distinction. Uh, between what uh, is morally good and bad and what moral obligations I have from what rights uh, people have. Rights is a more circumscribed notion. Um, I have uh, 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 moral obligations uh, to certain, uh, I think, to certain sorts of uh, 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 personal treatment of uh, uh, people as I encounter them on a daily basis. But I'm not sure that they have a right uh, to expect certain things from me and not other things. Josh? Um, I, I think, if, so far as I understand the question, that if you characterize somebody as having a right, that there is, that um, that, that does, part of the, the, the judgment that there's a right is a judgment that there is a pretty strong, not absolute, go back to an earthquake, but a strong obligation that you have to, uh, do what's required to respect the right, though what exactly is required depends, as I said in the discussion about positive and negative rights, what exactly is required depends on the details of the right in question. So there's a, a, a weighty reason that you have, or does the fact, but maybe your question is, does the fact that there's a right mean that the reasons are the weightiest that there can be? Um, I, I don't know if I'd want... You, can we get an area? 
Are there obligations that are distinct from the rights that people possess? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'm not sure now. I, now I, the, the force of the question is drifting for me. Uh, and I, I, so I, you have a right. I have I and everybody else. Which is one of these universal human rights is a universally dispersed obligation to do something it needs to be filled in what it needs to be to uh, respect that right. Um, how weighty, I thought you were asking about how important that obligation is, and I think designating a, this consideration as a right uh, uh, raises the weight <laughs> of the obligation up pretty high. Uh, is there nothing that can override the obligation that's associated with the right? No, I don't, I don't want to say anything so categorical as that. Um, <coughs> I may be missing the force of the question. I'm sorry if I am. Well, John, one last question for me to both of you. Is this written exchange going to be available if people would like it or at some later point? Or Sure. Okay. Um, uh, my hope is that somehow or other our, or the whole affair was uh, recorded. It was. Terrific. It was. Okay, <laughs> good. It was. Well, I just want to thank John Searle and Josh Cohn for this feast of intellectual uh, provocation. <laughs> Um, and for your patience and attention, you are rewarded with, uh, thanks to the College of Letters and Science, with a nice feast outside. <laughs>